Hello. In this second video, I'm going to use the virtual machine we created to look at a single subject's data. The clinical scenario is a child who has been having left frontal onset seizures, who has had normal MRIs, but a PET scan showing left hypometabolism. Here, we're going to look for signs of subtle cortical thickening that might overlap with the PET data. Let's get started. First, we'll need to get our patient's DICOM files from radiology. The Ginkgo CAD-X software that you installed on the first video will allow you to retrieve the files directly from a DICOM node if you have the address and port number. However, the settings you will need will vary from institution to institution. These can be set by going to Tools, Settings, and clicking on DICOM nodes on the left. Create a new entry and enter in the relevant information. For now, Let's assume that you have the DICOM images from a subject's MRI and PET studies on a CD or a thumb drive. On your host computer, copy the files into the shared folder we created earlier. Then, open a terminal window and navigate to the shared folder by entering CD space host. We can list the files to see it verify that the, the data is here and move back to our home directory. Let's convert the DICOMs into NIFTY format, which is the most commonly used imaging file format outside of clinical radiology, by using the, the command DCM to NII. You'll notice that the, the DICOM to NIFTY command created reoriented and cropped versions of the NIFTY file as well, labeled with the same file name with an O in the front for oriented and CO for cropped and oriented. Let's also convert our pet data from DICOM to NIFTY as well. Next, we'll take a look at these files with the Slices program from FSL. Slices only works on NIFTY files, but gives you a quick snapshot of what the volume looks like. Here, we'll look at the difference between the original T1 as it was stored by the scanner, and the reoriented T1 in conventional neuroimaging orientation. As you can see, the data has simply been rotated by 90 degree increments, and this does not degrade the data quality. We can also examine the cropped version, which, as you would expect, has had the empty space removed. Please be aware that some MRI vendors turn on JPEG compression inside of their DICOMs. If your images look like this image on the left, then navigate to the main directory for your DICOM images and run the command DICOM decompress, all one word, all lowercase. Then return to the step above and rerun DCM to NII. Let's copy the standard oriented file to our home directory and then take a look at our pet data. We can navigate to the pet folder, list all the files just ending in GZ, and view these files with slices as well. I know in advance that this file is the one we want. And there you see the pet data looks like a fuzzy image of the brain. We'll copy this file to our home directory as well. Before we run FreeSurfer's reconstruction script using the subject's T1 file, let's rename things to be a bit easier to read. We'll rename the T1 file t1.nifty.gz and the pet data fdg.nifty.gz. Run the command subdir, S-U-B-D-I-R, which is an alias for the command to let FreeSurfer know we're going to be making subject files in the current directory. And then we'll run Recon All, which is FreeSurfer's primary surface reconstruction and volumetric segmentation script. This will take about 7 to 12 hours depending on your computer. Make sure you're not logged off during that time. We will continue when that is done. Now that FreeSurfer is done analyzing the subject's T1, we can view the results either within the FreeSurfer provided tools like FreeView or use the Human Connectome Project's Workbench Viewer. I prefer the latter as I find it easier to load and view all of a subject's files at once and can be run on Windows machines easily, allowing more portability. To do this, I've written a basic script you see here called FreeSurfer to HCP Workbench Converter. At the command line, type in this command, 
followed by the name of our subject. This will take about 30 minutes or so. We will also want to look at our patient's FDG PET scan as well, so we should register this with the T1MP RAGE. For this, we'll use a software package called ANTS, which stands for Advanced Normalization Tools. Since the PET data is effectively just a fuzzy image of the brain, you may need to register it to an image of a brain extracted from RT1 instead of the original image with skull and neck intact. This is often the case with fMRI results as well. The brain extracted image can be found in the subject's one MRI subdirectory and is called brain.mgz, which is FreeSurfer's MGH Harvard formatted file. We can convert this to nifty by using the command MRI underscore convert with the name of the original file and then the name of the file with the new extension that we want. This program knows to convert this from MGH's format to nifty format. We can then make sure that this is oriented in the correct orientation using FSL's reorient to standard command. We'll send the output to our home directory. And we can verify that this is correct by using slices. We can also compare this to our FDG PET scan from before to see that in fact both do look pretty similar but still need to be registered together. I made an alias for the ANTS registration command called ANTS QUICK, as you can see here, to make things easier. So to register the FDG image to the brain image, we can enter ANTS QUICK dash D3 for three dimensions, dash TA for affine transformation, dash F for fixed and give the brain image, dash M for movable and give the FDG image, and then we'll tell it to label the output as FDG to brain. You can see here as this starts how these different input variables get coded into options for the registration computation. This will take a few minutes, so we'll continue when this is done. We can verify that the registration worked by using slices on both files together. You'll notice that the output from the ANTS registration is FDG to brain warped.nifty.gz. Specifying two images for the slices command tells it to use the second image as a red edged overlay, as you can see here and you can see that the two files actually line up quite well now. We can then add this to our workbench dataset by using another script I've put together. At the command, enter import volume to spec, and then give the subject name, the volume name, a short label to, for the file, in this case FDG, and then which layers you want to intersect the, the data with, either the peel surface, the mid-thickness surface, or the white matter surface, or all three. I'll cancel this to show you the usage of the command, as you can see here, with an example. We'll go ahead and select the command and run it now. This takes a few minutes Now, from within our subject's HCP subdirectory, we can start the Workbench Viewer software by typing wb underscore view at the command line. Choose the 164k spec file by double clicking on it, and then click load to load all of the files within the spec or specification file. There are several tutorials online that can walk you through all the features of the software, so in the interest of time, I'll simply show you some of the features pertinent to our present clinical, si clinical situation. Once the data loads, you will see the left and right cortical mic thickness surfaces labeled with the desiccant Kaleni atlas regions for the subject. You can click on the volume tab to, load the, to view the loaded nifty files and scroll through in different planes. Or the all tab to load both the surface renderings and volume slices at the same time. Here you can rotate and slide the volume slices to examine particular regions in detail. Let's return to the montage pane, and here you can see the mid-thickness surface is currently loaded. You can turn off various views with these check boxes here, and also change the displayed surfaces from the default mid-thickness gray to the peel surface, as you can see on the left, 
an inflated surface that lets you more easily see data in the sulci, a very inflated surface, which is even more so, or even the underlying spherical representation. The white matter surface is also available. We'll reset this to the gray, gray mid-thickness layer. You can also change the overlay for the, from the segmentation to other calculated measures such as thickness, which you can see here in rainbow color scale. We can adjust the color scale and range by clicking on the wrench icon. Here, you can see the average cortical thickness is around 3 millimeters, and we can adjust the range to better demonstrate clinical extremes. Interestingly, you can also view the two hemispheres as unfolded flat sheets, which allows you to view the entire cerebral cortex as once. We'll change the overlay to the calculated thickness and look for abnormalities, noting that there's a normal pattern that you will recognize after looking at a few subjects. This area here seems to indicate a focal thickening of the left medial frontal cortex that might correlate with the suspected seizure onset zone. If we return to the 3D surface views, we can switch to the medial view and see more clearly where this area is. You can see that there does seem to be an asymmetry here comparing the left and right cingulate cortices. In addition to visual inspection, you can also click on the 3D models to gain information about that location. If we click on our suspected lesion, you can see that the calculated thickness is 4.64 millimeters. You can also choose to view this data overlaid on the original T1 image. You can see here that the location we clicked on is also identified by crosshairs. We'll move the overlay toolbox from the bottom over to the left by clicking on view. And then add in this patient's FDG PET scan as well by clicking on the checkbox next to it. If we adjust the color scale, we can more easily see if the area of hypometabolism indeed aligns with the area of increased cortical thickness. I typically choose values that exclude the extremes and gives dynamic range to the upper half of the PET data to look for areas of cortical hypometabolism. In addition to the PET results, we can bring up the surface-based data we were just looking at as well. Choose the left and right mid-thickness surfaces and pick tab 1 to use the color scale we set up in that tab. You can also increase the visual thickness of the lines to more easily see the colors. Now, you can see that this area of cortical thickness actually is aligned with the area of hypometabolism. We can also turn on the peel and white surfaces instead to give you a visual impression of the cortical thickness as well as allow you to see the underlying PET data. We can also make the PET data transparent to allow the T1 data to show through by either turning it on or off or adjusting the transparency setting here. As you can see, there does seem to be some asymmetry. Finally, we can also inspect the values from the PET volume where it intersects with the cortical surfaces. To do this, return to the montage view and choose the left and right FDG layers from the overlay toolbox. Choose the FDG on mid-thickness intersection to look at cortical metabolism. Again, you can see the asymmetry between the left and right cingulate cortices. This concludes our practical demonstration. I hope this video illustrates the possibilities available with modern neuroimaging tools. Our goal is to encourage clinical trainees to become more interested in neuroimaging and help bridge the translational gap between the neuroscience laboratory and the neurologist workroom. Thank you for watching.